Welcome to this week's episode of Zapped to the Past. You may already have noticed that this intro is slightly different to your normal one, and that's because, well, it's a different kind of episode. We said last week that we're on holiday. Uh, well, one of us is. Well, we are. Anyway, we're on holiday. So to fill in the gap, we're doing another Ask the Podcast. This is the questions posed to us by our Patreon members via our Discord. There are a lot of questions. They have been a questioning bunch. They are. Um, and we owe it to them to give them answers. And uh, obviously, then you can listen to this as well as your weekly installment of Zap to the Past. So that's what we're going to do. We've got a lot of questions. Um, as mm. ever, I'm joined by Mr. Graham Raddings. Are you okay? Howdy, howdy do. Yeah, I'm okay. Thanks. Yeah, all good. Yeah, all good. <laughs> good, good. Uh, you've been AFK? <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't even know what that meant till 10 minutes ago, and even now I'm still confused. It's, it's, still, it's still confused. Um, I don't know <laughs> if my son was playing a trick on me, but uh, I suppose the AFK is it. For, for us oldies, it's away from console. I know. <laughs> I don't, I don't I can't, know. I can't well, though, probably, it. maybe it's not. I don't know. Maybe it meant something else, and he was just being polite. I don't know. Well, if you said AFC, isn't that a, some kind That's of football it. association or something? Uh, I thought it was a chicken shop. Yeah, or is it a league? The AFC. It sounds like an American football type league. I thought it was the AFL. It's an Arsenal Football Club or something. Is that <laughs> would, would that be known as the AFC? It could very well be Aldershot Football Club, Arsenal. <laughs> Any A's, really? <laughs> any Most any A's. A's. Novelties, party tricks. Oh, novelties, party tricks. <laughs> anyway. You forgot your fake dog poo. What? <laughs> fake dog poo. <laughs> and that was our first question. It that was. What really. fake dog poo? Uh, right, let's get into these <laughs> questions. So our first one is from David Hearn, and he asks, of all the games you've played so we don't have to, which one do you resent the most, knowing you won't get that time back? <laughs> That's a long list. <laughs> yeah, just, you know, 90%. Oh, what I resent the most. Uh, I don't know. What do you, what's, if you, if you, know, if you have a snap gut oh. decision, what would it be? I don't know that I resent them. I think there is that, there's some games that I've re, I don't want, I wish I hadn't played, but not because I resent the, the game itself, just because they were crap and it just, it, but to actually resent it, to think not only did that, was that game rubbish, but you know, I'm never getting that time back, you time wasting crazies. <laughs> Yeah, um, and so I'm going. I would exclude really crap games out of that. The ones that are just broken and rubbish. Um, yes, I don't know. Uh, that's a tough one, actually. I don't know. Sometimes I resent games that just are endless and they kind of have no meaning. I don't. I hate the game as such, but Gauntlet was a bit like that. I remember buying Gauntlet back in the day and the and the deeper dungeons. You did. And it was just endless. It was just the endlessness of it. Yeah, and that's kind of. So I was just playing that and just get, hoping there'd be something at the end of that, and there really isn't. It's just no. It just at the end of the at the end of all those levels, it just stops and waits for you to load more levels. Yeah, and that's all it does. And so maybe that. But. I did resent the time I tried to put into Hillsfire recently when there's nothing <laughs> there. <laughs> I, think Hill, I was like, well, this should be. I'm promised a big D and D adventure. Yeah, yeah, promised. It's the worst dungeon master ever, wasn't it? Yeah, it's a map. <laughs> What's in it? Nothing. Oh, oh, so much. So much stuff. You could have elaborated more on that a little bit. <laughs> could be some characters in the story. <laughs> Those are old school things. You don't need that. <laughs> you don't need so that. Don't um, don't I'm just trying to think, because we've played so many games, I mean, what, over a thousand now. Um, yeah. I'm just thinking, the, some of the, there's been the odd one, hasn't there, that's been like crap, like bad. Like so I think actually, you know what, I'm going to, I would almost exclusively say some of the arcade conversions, I do resent those because they should be either acknowledged that it shouldn't have been an arcade game conversion in the first place mm. and not just not do it that therefore not wasting my time or don't convert it so badly that I feel like my, you know, feel short changed. I mean, some of them are terrible. That street fighter, street fighter, honestly, okay. street Can fighter of. is so bad. Can of street fighter. They're so bad. Yeah. So bad. So maybe some of them, what's that? Um, wet Clemens is the one. Oh, oh, I've forgotten about that. <laughs> Why'd you mention that? Good Lord. 
I don't. I would also put in some of those ones that are just too stupidly hard. Yeah, um, yeah which can't phobia. be done. I mean, just a navy moves phobia. You know, games like that, army moves, mm. just they're just ridiculous. And, and the, yeah. the the difficulty is so stupid; it's just beyond the pale. And also, and also, I would the ones the other ones I would resent is where they take a much loved character, something like Scooby Doo or Yogi Bear, mm. and just stick them in rubbish. It's a, yeah. and and you know. That those kind of things annoy me as well a bit. So Yeah, and I think the, the final nail in the coffin for that would be games that have been released for licenses that were knowingly broken on release, that they deliberately... Robocop springs to mind. Yeah, and I'd also throw Pink Panther in the mix. <laughs> I'd throw it in the sea, never mind in the mix. But to be fair, I didn't resent Pink Panther so much, so I think I could just walk to the right and end the game. <laughs> yeah, you could just go to a desert island and end the game, yeah. Yeah, yeah but yeah, the Robocops, the... Um, Rastans. Because there's Rastans... Games where they where they knew it was broken and they yeah. released it anyway. And US Gold have had a few of them recently, haven't they? So yeah. some of that. Some of that some going of that. on. No, yeah. resent that. Also, do you think you'll do some Amiga specials from now until mid-91 when Zap reverted back to the C64 exclusively? No, I don't no. think we are. I don't think no, we are. We're sticking to the C64. It was the remit of the show and it's what we're sticking with. Yeah, I mean, maybe once we've done all the C64, at the end of it all, if there's an appetite... <laughs> After all that, I'm going to feel like Frodo at the end of uh, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> it is. I think we'll have we'll have just we'll just be exhaustive games. I think if there was ever going to be any Amiga specials, if there was ever going to be anything like that, it wouldn't be anything like the volume of games like we've done for the C64. It would just be maybe picking like the the Bitmap Brothers games and playing some of those, or yeah, picking our top five it. favorite Amiga games that we play. So they know the Swivs and the. And just revisiting them maybe for something as a special way down the line. But certainly no, there's no plans because there's so many Amiga games. They're so involved and I don't have the time. I'll be absolutely blunt. I simply would not have the time that to do true. all that. The C64 ones are pushing it. So Amiga just now, the multi-disc things and getting hold of them and the licensing is a bit weird and yeah. I don't think so. No. Andy Marsh asks, we convinced our parents that a personal computer would help us do our homework. Did it? <laughs> That's the first question. Did it? Did it? No. Did it? Uh, well, uh, computer studies, I mean, maybe, and then they wouldn't let me use it, so... Well, exactly. That's my exact point. Did it help me do my homework? No, because they wouldn't let me do my homework. Yeah. Because what I was doing was way outside of the realms of what they were capable of actually doing, and, and yeah. they, they couldn't do it. So, no, it didn't help. And by the time I did buy an Amiga for some word processing to sort of do essays, that was me buying that. I didn't need to convince anyone. So. Yeah, exactly that, yeah. No, and I didn't do word processing on my C64 or anything like that for school or anything. So I did use the sort of, you know, I'd be able to do like computer homework and all that stuff on it, and I did use mm. that as a kind of a bit of a leverage to, to get one. Oh, yeah, 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 the initial. But I didn't even have yeah. that. My brother just turned up one. I was like, okay. Oh, you didn't have to convince anyone then. Didn't have to convince anyone. But it did remind me of that song, by the way. We bought it to help with your homework. (laughs) Such a good song, that is. Yeah. I don't think this applies to any of us, really. If you started your computing life with a console like NES or Mega Drive, would you have learned as much? Would it have been as beneficial today? I mean, I started with an Atari VCS, I suppose, or a Binatone, but soon... Yeah, so technically you started with a console. Yeah, I did, supposedly. Would it have been as beneficial with a NES or a Mega Drive? No, absolutely not. And there was clear evidence of that as well. Mm. No, the generation that came after the bedroom coders and everything else didn't really have standard chance coding with any. You couldn't do anything on those, could you? So it did. There was a large kind of blockade of that. Yeah, um, I think. Um, so anyone that started their computer, such as a, you call it computing life, with a console, I can only imagine that it wouldn't be as beneficial for them if they wanted to go into computing or anything like that. Although it might have piqued their creative curiosity to make them want to study more computing science and things later down the line, which of course you'd have needed to do something like that. So maybe yeah. it did. But... Yeah, my limited understanding of sort of British sort of NES or Mega Drive coders were they were sort of retro. They were coming in the back door, weren't they? They were retrofitting them. They were retconning them. They were pulling them apart. Sort of see, how do- it's like people like Rare, I think, who went, mm. you know, who, when Ultimate went to become Rare. I think they, yeah, they, they, uh, there were other sort of some other companies that were taking, looking at what those things were doing and doing it backwards. So I don't think there was much support. The dev pipelines had changed. You've gone from sort of having one machine where you were coding on, so then you the, you gradually got to machines that you would then write the code on, and it would then pass it and create. Yeah code on other machines and then you had to create cartridges yeah exactly that you know nobody was making games at home for the nes were they no no they were no. they were and it, they relied on expensive dev machines and all the rest of it and you needed to know your way around proper code and i mean some people made the transition from 16-bit didn't they to 
Mega Drive and all the rest of it. Some people made that. I mean, sensible. And, and some of those guys are not. They all sort of released games eventually on the various consoles. They did, they? yeah. I mean, I don't know what this. Yeah, like I said, but that was later on. That was in the nineties, wasn't it? That's when the Mega Drive and the SNES sort of thing. I don't know what the realities like. were of. I, I imagine releasing something on one of those things was a piggy nightmare. You know, it's not yeah. like you could just give it, create it in basic, stick it on a tape, and give it to your mate. Is it in the playground? <laughs> no. I mean, if you did that with a Meg, you know, Mega Drive cartridge, I'd, I'd have been impressed if someone, yeah, this is my game, I made that on a Mega Drive. I'd be like, wow, how did you do that? <laughs> but that would never happen, though. You don't want to know. <laughs> No, but, but uh, that answers the next question. <laughs> um, yeah, it probably does. The question is, did you ever sniff those methylated spirits when cleaning your tape deck heads? I don't think yes. I did. Did you? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it <laughs> smells that nice. explains a lot. <laughs> it is. I drank it. No, I bloody cleaned with it. Ah. I didn't really. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think I ever did. I don't think I ever cleaned my tape heads. What? Yeah, because you have to clear, get the old cotton bud out and use the old. I didn't. I don't think I used methylated spirits. I think I used um, isopropyl alcohol, but I didn't want to use white spirit. I think, I might, I think I might just use vinegar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it would have potentially corroded them a bit, but yeah, it would have worked. I mean, it would have blended them in, and they'd have smelt like pickled onion monster munch. If you used <laughs> exactly. Malt it's a win-win. <laughs> Um, Lee Dove asks, when did you move on from the C64 and other machines? Well, that could be a bit more, but we'll just go with the C64. When did we move on from C64? I think we've uh, already spoken about it. Yeah, I mean, I was about 89, 90. I was really. 89. The summer of 89 was when we were coding most of the demos. We kind of stopped doing that by the February of the 90, because it was February, February, March 90, when I coded my last C64 demo, which was The Eyes Have It. Never got released, I don't think. And then I got an Amiga shortly after that. I tr- sold all my C64 completely, lock, stock and barrel, and got an Indeed. Amiga with the money. But what, I put that towards it, because that's what you had to do back then. Yeah. Juan Luis Sanchez asks, do you play any of the games with your kids? The C64 games? I did. I've, do, I've done it with a couple. Yeah, I've done it with a couple. I tried, I tried but it's hard. He's 14 now, and he just plays... Fortnite <laughs> and Rocket yeah, League. My, my, let's say, so. my, my lad's the same age, 15. He, he, he entertained me, me going, oh, it's the, but really good. And he played World Games with me. And he was like, oh, it's great. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. go back to this PS, <laughs> you know, PS4 game. Like. Yeah, exactly. So. so, But, he, you know, but he did say he enjoyed World Games. He really liked it, especially the, the, the fun of it. Because as we've said many times with the Epics games, they're an easy in. Yeah, it didn't exactly. take him long to figure out how to play it with the joystick. And then we were off. That's mm. the magic. That's the magic. I, I remember playing, it, was, it must have been years ago, it must have been like three or four, four, it must, yeah, it must have been about four, I think. I remember uh, having, uh, playing Dig Dug, Dig Dug and Mr. That's Do. That's a good game, that is. Mm. Yeah, just giving him the joystick and let him play that. Andy Mask asks, did you ever spill breakfast or dinner on your computer? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah, loads of times. <laughs> Probably. Did you ever type in a listing from a magazine? Yes. Did it work? Yeah. Not all the time. No. <laughs> 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 Not all the time. No, I remember typing in a really, really long one. Of, no, I, I couldn't tell you what magazine it was. Probably maybe an early com- Commodore user or something, but it was meant to be a, a version of the Amiga bouncing ball, the famous Amiga bouncing ball, but on the C64. And it was a really long t- two or three pager with just endless data statements. And so it was obviously oh, right. just, you know, poking data statements into and, and basically assembling machine code out of basic. Yeah. And it didn't work. And it took me hours typing it in. And, and it was just data, 326, comma, 163, comma, 125, comma. And it was just endless. Typed it all in, typed run, nothing. It's like, oh, f- this for a game of soldiers. <laughs> yeah, never doing that again. I fell no. foul of the uh, you know the infamous Zap, April Fool, type this in and it'll double the speed of your C64 thing uh, or whatever. I think Andrew... That was, uh, that was mean, though. Yeah, I know. I typed, it wasn't very long, but I did type it in that it's going to, April Fool suckers or something. I was like, ah. Oh. Yeah, that was a bit Damn mean. You. I mean, I to be said, fair, but... I also had very mixed results with some of their, like, sort of, you know, these pokes, the pokes and cheats the pokes and the counts stuff. that they give you. And I had mixed results with them. So, because yeah. most of them sort of involved a reset button at some point. I didn't have one of those, nor was I about to start sticking bloody paper clips in the back of my dip slots <laughs> no, to make either. it happen. I oh, know. Quite a long one here, but I, and this sort of leads to something else we may do. I don't know. Well, I'm not probably going to do it in this way, but would you consider running an event as up to the past fest? <laughs> Will you hire a venue, folks buy tickets and come along? I don't think we'd get enough people and come along to challenge <laughs> each other in retro games. Have competitions, prizes. Best dress gets a copy of Wizball. Worst gets a copy of Lee Enfield. People can bring both God's their stuff. hardware, retro best or Sunday best. I mean, it's getting, well, okay. You guys could record a podcast live, interact with patrons. I think we'd just go to arcade club yeah this is we've got we've had that idea of arcade club or you know any any one of the retro events there's re- replay blackpool yeah. retro event yeah. in blackpool that's every october that's a good event although you have to go to the norbrick hotel in blackpool which well 
let's just say it's uh, it's the Nordbreck Hotel in Blackpool. It's, it's a one of a kind experience. That it sounds like ready Breck. It's it's it's, it's a one of a kind experience. <laughs> Those that have been there know what I'm saying. Um, anyway, let's leave it there. Um, just you know, go on um, on TripAdvisor, mm. uh, but so we could sort of piggyback on the back of one of those because there's a oh, few. Which of those. I think would be the more sensible thing to yeah. do. And there's, I miss, I didn't get a chance to go to the Zap, you know, the Zap gathering that was. No, recently I didn't done, either. Which looked amazing. I know one of our patrons went. I think was it Doctor Goggles. I think went. One of them went. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. And they looked like they had an amazing time. So there's an opportunity. Perhaps next time that comes around, if timing permits, cause it's not so easy to do. And we fit this in around our day jobs. So mm. it's not so easy to sort of go, you know what, let's just nip over there. It's very difficult to justify to my boss and go, all right, see you later. Don't, never mind that deadline. <laughs> I'm just going to nip off to this event. Yeah. Um, but uh, so we, it's more likely that, because those things happen at those events anyway. So naturally we could sort of, you know, you could just there. go. Yeah. Um, Andy Marsh asks, are pteropods alien dog eggs? <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm just going to say yes. 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 Yes, they are. Easy answer. Easy. That's an easy one. <laughs> That's an easy one. David Hearn asks again, do you ever catch up to try the two-player modes on the games? Wondering how much a good two-player mode might affect your thoughts. Pit Stop 2, Trailblazer, they shine with the second player, Spy vs. Spy. Mm, <sighs> Was dull solo that. player and <laughs> dull two-player mode. <laughs> Made it more, a bit more fun, for example, <laughs> bit being the operative word we could and we will do and we've been we've been talking about this we probably will do it at some point it would be cool i mean i know i'd get my ass kicked at international karate um because you always used to do that. that you did you always used to beat me at ik plus and IK. yeah but I'm, I'm 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 my reaction times are not you know i'm more i'm more mr miyagi now than bloody danielson <laughs> all right okay uh i probably but yeah but we might do at some point i think we should some yeah of these. We, that's that was always the kind of we've been talking about that for a while haven't we but not spy versus spy i refuse no, I refuse as well. Go to like some, Summer game. Games 2 or something like that, or Winter Games or something, or World Games. Yeah, one of, any one of the games, games and something like that. Yeah, it's, it's definitely on the cards. It's definitely on the cards, that. <laughs> Andy Marsh asks, did you ever take your computer apart and then to clean it? That sounds like two separate questions. Why would you, <laughs> why would you take it apart otherwise? I, mean, I did. No, I, I never did. No, I never I opened did. mine. <laughs> you didn't open mine. I, I did. Of course I did. Was, don't forget, it was my brother's. Yeah, so I, true, I was always true. like, this isn't actually mine. So if I took a screwdriver and just came in, you just found with bits all up, I'd be like, <laughs> what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I took mine apart. What did I do? I changed the red light on it for a green LED. I replaced some of the Ooh, keys. Fancy. And just did, you know, and I always kept it kind of clean and hoovered because I had a lot of people, my C64 was used by a lot of people. I mean, nowadays it's like a COVID nightmare because you know, <laughs> I had people breathing all over it and dribbling on it. And I had more people typing in code and, scroll texts and everything else it was a no it's a demo coder slash demo scene traders machine so it was heavily used and it was used by a lot used. of people so i kept it clean the only the only trouble i had really aside from the c64 itself which was generally well behaved power supplies were haunted me with them damn things because they always bloody broke always like oh they yeah. threw about five of them bloody awful things but the c64 and the disk drive oh the disk drive i have nightmares about that thing <laughs> Oh, <laughs> it's just it because that it's honestly the, it used to vibrate that heavily the 15 because i had a 1541 c which i'm not sure what the c stood for i think it was clack because it was Crap. extra loud and clacky as soon as you <laughs> turned it on nah, 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 and it was like and you knew it was just on a path of destruction for itself eventually it was going to rattle its own heads out of alignment which it yep. did a lot oh god that thing nightmare yep. nightmares about that sound um <laughs> Nick Bungus asks, uh, would we do an episode where we compare the US versions of games against their European counterparts and score accordingly? Um, I think we do that as we go along, don't we? Generally, if we yeah. find them. We have, we, we, we certainly do. Yeah, more. We've done it more recently. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if we could, if we find out there is a US version, of a, you know, we will talk about the pair of them. So I think we did that with, I think we, we go in all the way back. We did it with um, Space Area. We did. Yeah. We did. Yeah, so Space Area did it with Street Fighter. I think we yep. mentioned Rampage, Outrun, Akari Warriors, Bionic Commando. Yeah. yeah, I think we have. I think we've, where, where yeah. there's a US, but we did it. Was it 720 Degrees? There was a, yeah, 720. One, was that one, one of the well. skate games, I think. So, yeah, I think, yeah. We, I think we've kind of done I don't know that we rate them. We just, we'd often say whether they're, because normally they're better. kind of better. Yeah, they're normally slightly better or slightly worse than this. But yeah, that's not how we do it. Uh, he actually does have a question. He's been developing a version of Pitfall 2 Arcade. Uh, very good okay. as well it is it seen. is yeah um it shows this as the arcade version gameplay is amazing the aspect ratio and the two pixel wide graphics suit the medium res these four there are also other games such as punch out geometry dash stick creep my question is which games would you like to see ported to the old bread bin and why the modern geometry dash good lord stick cricket um so modern anything anything modern that you'd modern like to see games ported? 
port, deported God, back. Yep. They have I mean, enough trouble yeah, deporting some of the bloody thingy ones. Amiga games, but you could. I mean, mm-hmm. you could do certain things. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'd like to see super. I mean, I think there was some. Didn't someone do a C sixty four version of Super Hexagon? I think someone did that, didn't they? Uh, wouldn't know you. That, I, I don't think know, someone did maybe. that. Be, that's quite cool. But things like that, VVVVV, sort of basic platformers and things. I think you can maybe be able to do versions of them. Um, maybe that. Maybe. I don't know. Um, I saw there was a good version of Limbo, um, that, or somebody started to develop on the C64, which looked bloody amazing. Yeah. So maybe those kind of games, you know, the, the, the games like that, or the, is it the Silent Age was another one that was a bit like that. And there's a, um, I'm just looking now, and there's a few mobile type games that are more, that are more modern ones. Inside, that's the one I was thinking of, where there's probably a good case for creating a C64 version of those. Yeah. Um, old arcade type game, well, new arcade type games. I just I can't think. Of, I don't play a lot of the new, new, new arcade. So yeah. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. Would I, what would I like to see ported? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I honestly don't know. I'd like to see. Um, I know what Pengo, a really good version of Pengo on the C sixty four. Because I don't know, I, I know that there is a really good one. Oh, okay. I don't know. Yeah, there's a really go. good version, like a modern coded version with all the modern you know, tricks and code that they could use for that. It'd be quite good to do that. Mm. Or a Mister, a new Mister Do. You know. I mean, something like Shovel Knight would probably be able to be done because um, that's the. That is. It's a sort of platformer that hacks back to the NES and stuff, so you could probably right. do something like that. It's just, you're a single sprite, and I think you just bounce around with a shovel. Super um, Meat but Boy, would that be a... Uh, thing? You could, you may be able to do something like Super Meat Boy or Binding of Isaac or something like that, things, mm-hmm. things like that, sort of single screen. Oh, God, things, imagine maybe. the YouTubers, they've all, they've all just shot the load off in their trousers because somebody <laughs> mentioned the Binding of Isaac. That, that <laughs> created a million YouTube careers, didn't it, that game? It, it probably, I think it did. Thousands of YouTubers just gone, what, a new version? <laughs> <laughs> All cried out in fear and then were silent. <laughs> um, <laughs> just to add to this question, is there anything you think should be redone on the C64 as the original 64 version was so poor and the machine is more than capable of doing a decent version? Uh, yeah, Ooh. plenty. <laughs> um, but yeah, we've seen a lot of them. I mean, we saw like a really good version of Ghost and Goblins, a really good version of Commando. Yeah. Um, you know, so there's those kind of... Uh, classic 2d stuff i think there's some i'm trying to think i mean things that i would have liked to have seen i, I think know. they could have done a better version of street fighter because they were, the template for that was already there with where the exploding fist there's two a two two yeah fighter yeah, should have done yeah. so it's 2d fighting games that that template was kind of already there on the cc it wouldn't have taken a great deal to change the graphics to be more street fighter yeah, would it really absolutely yeah and I, i'd like i mean some of the sort of tv licensing as well i would i would like to see a decent knight rider game because yeah i'd agree with that I'd agree you know with that. those, those yeah. kind of things. I think there's plenty of mileage in in those ideas around those things where you mm. could have done something better than that horror show what we got. So something like that maybe. Yeah, and perhaps maybe. more pirates games of that type and less vector simulations for microprose because they you know the, the games that were successful. Pirates is a really good game on the C64 and a good template yeah. for those kind of things. And yet they ended up doing more of the sort of you know stealth fighter type games yeah and flight flight and I, did, I never thought they were that good on the c64 maybe that's just no me. i didn't either um andy mask has got a load here was jason donovan singing about c64 double dragon sprites in his hit track too many broken hearts <laughs> yes probably he was. yeah we wrote too many asked and he was like yeah you that was exactly it nobody got that. <laughs> nobody well done that's no, the stop writing to me and my favorite food is <laughs> chips Last time, <laughs> was, there, was there was there ever any bread in the old bread bin C sixty four? Well, you took yours apart. Did you put bread in it? I never put bread in it. Um, no, you you no, put bread no, in everything else. I seem to remember. Yeah, but I never put I never actually put bread in my bread bin. I never referred to it as a bread bin. That came way later. So. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, these questions are hard. Did you and your mates ever create a version of the Conics multi system using some old wood, your grand's rocking chair, and some portable clothesline that you found down in the shed? How did you mount the CRT? Um, well, how did? I mean, that assumes we did it. How did it all end? Well, no. <laughs> that sounds like that sounds like something out of the movie Saw. <laughs> And I did actually, now I did own a Conix Speed King joystick, which you was did? their ergonomic joystick, which, you know, was great for right-handed people because that's the only only way you could hold it. There's a picture here of the multi, of the uh, of the of the actual thing itself, and it looks dangerous. It's the only way I can describe it. Did people really own that? Because that TV <laughs> looks like it's going to come off there. That TV looks precariously balanced. <laughs> I don't know, and that the bit where you've got to, you've got to sit with your legs apart. Look, that don't look comfy. No, I think that seems to be overkill for for pit for pit stop, whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think I'll just settle for a TV and and gr- I'll be grounded. I'll sit on a chair. You know, I don't need that. I mean, and that 
that crotch barrier is that looks that looks painful. Who wants to sit like that? <laughs> yeah, no one. No one does. Um, let's move along quickly because it's making me it's making me twitch just looking at it. It looks uneasy. Al eighty two retro asks, would you consider doing a special episode covering other early titles not reviewed in Zap? Love to hear your thoughts on things like Quo Vadis, which you mentioned in the episode. I'll just say, watch this space. Yes. Yes. You know, watch we this have, space. We, we have plans, so watch this space. Yes. Yes. Or listen to this space because we're podcast. Yes. Uh, Watch Mark this Fletcher. space, they said, looking at each other shiftily. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mike Fletcher says, which year would you say was the C64's greatest in terms of games? <laughs> Appreciate it. You know still what? a couple of years to go in that timeline. It's probably fair to argue the high watermark has been and gone. Or has it? Great. Well, now, it depends how you measure the, the term greatest. Yeah. Doesn't it, really? I mean, the biggest number of games was 87, so... yeah. You know, but, so but that I don't doesn't know. mean anything. Yeah. I is there a less is more sort of idea? Because I think if you went for volume, is it, volume of games on the 64 doesn't mean what we've proved in this podcast, the volume of games coming out does not match the quality. <laughs> no, it does not. So just because there's a thousand games doesn't mean there's, there's, there's a thousand great games. There isn't. In fact, the ratio is actually pretty alarming. Mm-hmm. So, and then as we've gone through 1989, what we've discovered is there's less games, but the quality isn't going up. So <laughs> there, there is the occasional one. Yeah. So, Which but you know, but in, a, in a, but in a year where you, if in say 1989, there's let's say there's a hundred games released to the C64, and out of every magazine, two or three of those are better. Does that make it the better year statistically? Because more games are better. Uh, maybe. I don't know. And then when it comes to greatest games, are you thinking about games that were the whiz balls of this world, which are just kind of de facto classics? Because there aren't many of those. There aren't many of games of that quality. So I don't know. It's very hard to say in terms of. Peak years, there's an argument for 1984-85 for the C64. There is. Yeah, there is. Before the 16-bit machines arrived and people yeah. were designing for that. You did just a lot of very... In that early sort of first 17 episodes we did for 1985, there was a lot of crud, but there were also Summer Games 2, Paradroid, things like that. Yeah, um, exactly. There was a lot. I mean, but it would, it's it's somewhere between 85 to 87 or 84 to 87. 87 sort of drops off, but probably 84 to 86 is probably the highlight. So and he says, "Has the high watermark been and gone?" That's that's different because that watermark moves um, like the tide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the tide in Seaside Special. Well, it, it moves it, it in does a bitty move, manner, doesn't it? I mean, because in this, we know that in this year we've got some really good, good C sixty four games coming out. So we've got Myth. We've had a few surprises, Grand Prix Circuit, and things like that. They've yeah. really surprised us. And so every now and again, we get one of them. The Train was another example of games that just come out of the blue a little bit. And you think, well, actually, these are, the 64 is really good at this. Mm. And then you get other games. And there was what was that big um, RPG that we played that really surprised us both? That was times really of good lore. as well. So you get and Times of Lore of this world. Yeah, exactly. And we know that there's one next in the next episode that we'll record that's going to be quite interesting. Yeah. So I don't know. Has, it depends how you've judged the watermark. It's quite a good question, actually, that in terms of its sort of the multi ways you can approach the sort of the sort of answer to it. And it's a good one also because, of course, we've played every single game just about. I mean, there's, a, there's very few we haven't now. It's obviously a cluster of them, but mm. the, you know, uh, has that watermark ever been that high on the C64? Well, there's been moments when some of the games have been brilliant, but not many of them. There's far more that have been. Yeah, the tide went out and left the fish flapping. I think. <laughs> More like a tide mark rather Skid than a watermark. Mark. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, exactly that. So, um, but as the best, is there more and the best yet to come? I don't know. There's still a few. There's a few good ones. There's a few good ones out. Yeah, we had them. It's been hard sort of things. Obviously, we have a certain period where we played as well. So we have a, you know, we try to wipe that nostalgia away. It's, it's impossible to fully get rid of it because you are, you do know some of these games. We don't know some of these, so those are the ones that have surprised, surprised us. Mm. But I am well aware that as, like, we've just looked at Cocker Tony Wolf and you can see the massive improvement in quality and tech knowledge and stuff like that between something like that and what you get to in 1989, where we're up to now. And I'm pretty sure there are still some technically impressive, we've got things like Monsters in Mayhem Land or whatever is Monsters and mayhem and creatures yeah, and things yeah, like that to come like which that. we know yeah. are technically astonishingly high mm. so but I, I don't know it depends where you sort of put all, you know you'd never have got them in yeah. 86 because they didn't probably know how to do them they didn't have the technology so yeah. you exploit these games were coming up now we should expect to be really exploiting the machine mm. we would expect <laughs> yeah yes i have to say there is a bit of that going on but this is the publishers and we've had this debate and we're watching it sort of play out before our very eyes. There's a lot of yeah. really well-meaning good coders and programmers on the C64. Always has been, always will be. But there were a lot of exploitative publishers out there who were giving really short timelines, wanting to get the game from somebody's idea on the back of a cigarette packet to on the shelf on a cassette or whatever, 
in a six to eight week timeline because that was the maximum amount of time they felt was you needed to create a game, at least not to create a game, but to create something they could put on a shelf so some sucker would buy it. There's a lot of that going on and way more than I ever thought. But I wasn't really buying games at this point, certainly. So, but it's that, that's the thing that's really coming back to sort of really keeps repeating on me with this stuff is that that is the prevailing notion. Like I say, we've got amazing games to come. They're all the games that have been given where the, where the developers have been given time to develop them. The yeah. ones that they haven't are clearly becoming obvious, really yeah. obvious now. And, yeah, they and then we hear some of the horror stories of them not getting paid and all the rest of it. And they're like, nah, it, just, it feels like it's a bit of an industry that's taking the mickey out of the developers. And they 16-bit came along, really. And as we've sort of we've discussed in sort of around the periphery with, the, with people like the Bitmap Brothers, they weren't taking any crap from any of these publishers. They went in and said, look, we know, where our, we know our value. We're good developers. We won't develop crap product. We want this kind of money. And if you don't like, if you don't pay us that kind of money, we'll go somewhere else because, you know, we, we have value. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that, that was a, that's a sea change from the public saying to some 17 year old kid and his dad make out run in six weeks. or wouldn't, you know, oh, that's it. No, that's a very different paradigm. So, um, Andy Marsh asks, what about taking C64 game review requests? My request would be drills on the C64. Again, watch this space. Watch this space. Yeah. Yes. That's going to be a watch word. <laughs> watch this space uh david hen writing us uh david hen says apart from coronation street and sons and daughters what are your favorite tv or netflix shows <laughs> no, can we just well, clarify can... something <laughs> there. <laughs> that you love coronation street which is where Coron- we all Cor- know <laughs> coronation street and sons and daughters are not my favorite tv shows <laughs> nor have they ever been <laughs> just, just, thank you david <laughs> just because i know the themes off by heart doesn't mean i like them <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. If you get, you know, something played at you long enough, it will just embed itself in your head. You can't. Yes. I mean, you like it. And plus, for me, Prisoner Cell Block H wins all of them. I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> that's because that's because I used to bring you roses. <laughs> oh, she would again. And But things are different now. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, it's too, that's such a massive question. I mean, there's, like, there's loads of TV shows I like. Loads. Which is what are your favourite TV shows though? Your favourite, you like? uh, what's your favourite? I mean, okay, um, Lost, Fringe, Battlestar Galactica, the new one, if I sort of thing, uh, Penny Dreadful, stuff like that. I'd go with. Oh, uh, Money Heist on Netflix. I thought that was amazing. There you go. I'll do. What about yours? Mm, okay, let me think. Love is Blind. I <laughs> like that. You and me are very different. <laughs> Selling Sunset. Quite like that. Um... <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do have to, I do have to watch those by proxy of having a you know a, a wife that really enjoys that kind of thing and you know I vicariously enjoy those. But um, if uh, in the moments where I get the controls, I don't know. I like sci-fi TV shows, so you know I'm, I'll stick. I'm, I actually don't like many of the Marvel shows, although I do have to say I watched um, oh uh, One Division. One Division. So I watched One Division, which was actually quite incredible. I was really impressed with that. Yeah. Um, but I don't deliberately watch any of those shows because I get I get angry with them because they're all based around knowing a lot of stuff about the things that go on around that universe and star wars has recently really annoyed me with that oh, what like ahsoka which is like what's all that about who are these people exactly with it with an ending that made no sense to anybody unless you'd, you you know you were embedded in jedi lore and you knew all about yeah. and who is this bearded man on a cliff i know it's, it's very <laughs> sad that he passed away but what, what who are these people anyway um why is there a guy with Blue skin. What's what's the deal with him? Why are there three witches? Why why are there witches? Where's Luke Skywalker? General Prawn. <laughs> <laughs> no one's going to be frightened of General Prawn. <laughs> no. One. But I liked From. Was a good TV series. Very like Lost. I liked Lost again back in the day, of course. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I like I like shows like that. Anything yeah. that's got a bit of mystery, intrigue, stuff like that. I like some of the murderous ones. You know, the, but they always tend to. Where they stick to them and the story gets good, I, I like them. But they all tend to lose their way. I was really into that vampires one that was really good for a while. The, the strain. Oh yeah, yeah. I and, watched until all it that. became yeah. a strain to watch it in the <laughs> yeah. final season. The, yeah, but it started so well. But that's a lot of the story with these, isn't it? Start really well, goes crazy. Yeah, Westworld was another example. Oh, of don't. That. That's another one. Yeah, such yeah. a good, good, interesting idea, and then it just went wild. Yeah. I'll throw a Deadwood into the mix as well because Deadwood's amazing. It's the Western one, right? Yeah, it's really, really, really good. And uh, a That's personal favourite, <laughs> massive amounts, but a personal favourite of mine as well would always be Alias as well. No, yeah, you're big into that, aren't you? J.J. Abrams' earliest ones, yeah. Speaking of which, are we going to do any more Battle of the Pilots? Yes. <laughs> yes, we are. Yes, this is the simple answer to that. We will yes. do. They're, 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 they, you know, uh, we do them where we sort of want to do something different. So we will be exactly, doing more they're, of them. They're exactly, they're a, they're a Marvel Universe and a DC Universe thing. 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, since David Hearn asked since starting the podcast, name a game you play to review and enjoyed so much you've returned to it since. The Train. Yeah, I've played The Train. I've gone back and done Neuromancer, played a bit of that. Mm. There's been a few actually that I've gone back and played. Yeah. What was the boxing shooter? game? I've been, I've been playing quite. I keep going back to that Bomb Fusion. Yeah, another good one. I, I've been enjoying that over the last few weeks just because it's just a quick, quick little blast. I can just stub on and I just bounce mm. around to that that jumpy music and I quite have a quite a good time for sort of half an hour and then I'm done. Yeah, yeah. A few of those I've visited. Yeah. Andy Marsh asks a lot of questions. Have you kept any of the game systems or toys from back in the day? No, I have none of them. No, I don't anymore. I did actually find um, in my mum's loft my original astro wars oh wow cool um, which is still in its box believe it or not but other than that no i'll do these quick fire what was the very first time you saw a computer and what made you decide i need one of those i saw a zx80 at my friend john tasker's house that his dad had just bought and and constructed built. yeah built built yeah. and i remember just i wasn't over i wasn't so much impressed with because i couldn't quite understand what i was seeing bear in mind we're going back to well, early 80s, really early 80s. Yeah, yeah. But what I remember thinking was that this was something I'd only seen in, like, t- and thought of in films and telly, and it was like something that was, I thought would be dead expensive. So it was just like, I was, and it, in fact, it was plugged into an ordinary telly and stuff. I was just like, what is going on? And kind of piqued my interest. So, yeah, I think mine was not it wasn't a computer, it would have been a console. I think someone, one of my brother's friends had a, um, an Atari or, Oh, well, I mean, when we got to the Binotone, it was just one of those. I, can't, I honestly can't remember what the first thing I saw. It may have been something in the arcade. Could have been anything around that period. But Later down the line, I had a few people that had Spectrums. Like Spectrums, but the 16K Spectrum, you know, the, the, the not the yeah, 48K yeah. one. I had a few people that knew, had them, and I saw a few games of them, like Scuba Dive was one game I remember seeing. And, and of course, Jetpack. Mm. Everyone seemed to own Jetpack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and I start so I started to the first games I experienced were on the probably on the Spectrum and on the uh, Econ Electron. Mm. Um, and then after all of those, I saw Ghostbusters on the C sixty four, and that was it. Sold. You need one of them. Yeah, I mean the first games I was playing, like I said, were on the we had the Atari VCS. So yeah, yeah, I remember the old playing this, but I never and... never remember wanting one. But when it was when I saw Ghostbusters and heard that Ghostbusters speech and that. No, never, we had a bike. We had like a family binotone. Everyone had a family binotone. Yeah, the orange one. Then. The orange one with yeah. the, the, the pads that pulled out the big, of wires. Yeah, the, the pads, and then you had the big sort of sliders for like yeah. volume sliders on it. Yeah. <laughs> so everyone, I think they issued them to dads in the bloody like eighties, <laughs> mid seventies, or something. Hand them out free from the back of a lorry. You know, we shoot the dot game on it and all that. But we, de- I mean, my I played on Atari's because I ever played Pitfall and um, the twenty six hundred swept through the schools, didn't they? No, every every kid sort of. Oh, the kid had an Atari 2600 at a certain point. Mm. I remember playing Pac-Man, playing Pitfall on it mm. um, and stuff like that. I remember, going to a, I remember going to a friend's birthday party and his entire birthday party was based around us all playing Pitfall. <laughs> That's a good birthday party as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, totally cool. Yeah. I remember eating jelly and ice cream and watching somebody play Pitfall was a... Like a that was considered cool. Yeah, the best Crazy. game we had on it was the uh, Empire Strikes Back game. That was cool. Oh yeah, good. that looked good. That was a good game. That was. Do you remember what happened to your final CRT monitor? I think my mum still used it until she was no longer able to use it. Well, CRT monitor substitute telly. Yeah, telly. Ferguson, yeah. Ferguson, fourteen inch portable TV. Yeah, Ferguson soup superstar. What was it? Ferguson. What was Man, it? Was it something video? Not a video, video star. star. Was it? It was the video. That was it. The video star. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but my 14-inch Ferguson portable TV, which, by the way, has also been used for various gigs. We, because <laughs> we, when Aidy and I were in a band together, um, we didn't have a drummer originally. We did in the end, but we didn't have a drummer, so we used an Amiga 500 with mm. Optimed, and we had a, all of our drums and percussion were done via drum machine, which yeah, is kind of crazy when you think about it. And so we had to cut an Amiga 500 and a TV <laughs> and an adapter and a disc drive and all of that stuff with us when we did a gig, which we did. In the town hall in Grimsby, amongst many other places, and that TV did the rounds. Anyway, that TV still exists and it still works, and it is at my mum's house to this oh, day. There you go. Cool. Describe your first electric shock experience. Was it a computer that did it? <laughs> <laughs> I honestly can't remember. I think it was dodgy plug wiring in the seventies. Uh, I'm trying to think. Well, my it depends. It depends on the severity. The first shot that made me jump was, I think, I don't think it was anything to do with the computers. I think it might have been to do with trying to get something jammed out of a toaster. Um, <laughs> with a fork. My first, my first proper serious electric shock um, was when I was um, faffing about with a fuse board and um, it, the jolt of electricity went through me and threw me off a ladder. <laughs> 
that's not good. What were you doing? What were you doing on a ladder at the time? Because I because I couldn't reach the the um the the consumer oh, right. unit okay. they call them now. But Sorry, we'll go okay. back into old money where you had wires that sort of you coiled around a thing. Yeah, and I remember climbing up there and poking at it with something because it had gone <laughs> off, and I was terrified. My my mum and dad were going to find out that I'd, I think I think I'd done something stupid, and it tripped the whole house's electricity out. So I went to sort of you know, fix it as as best I knew. <laughs> <laughs> put the put the, try to do it. Try to pull the thingy out, and it, and then it just the electric shock arcs and hit me, and it threw me off the ladder, and then he knocked me unconscious. So I came round about thirty five minutes later, and I was like, "That was weird. What happened? What happened? Why am I why am I crumpled up on a bag, big bag of potatoes?" God. <laughs> so land, we used to buy sacks of potatoes back then. You know, because all these crazy it sounds crazy now, but we had a, we used to have like a, a room, like a like a pantry type room. He did in the house in Cleethorpes where we lived at the time, and we used to buy sacks of twenty-five kilo sacks of potatoes because we was in a big family, so we used to put a lot of spuds. We're in Lincolnshire in the UK, you know, it's the home of the potato. So to, and then, so and the, the fuse box was in there, so I remember getting zapped and then coming round, and I was just crumpled in a heap on this big massive bag of potatoes. That was dead uncomfy. Yeah, so that's, nothing to do with computers. It was, yeah, I was really, I could have been quite badly injured. It was kind it of stupid, have, yeah. really. Um, did you covet the Argos catalogue? And what pages did you covet the most? <laughs> Be honest. Uh, I didn't. No, not really. I was more of a K's catalogue man. K's or Freeman's, yeah. K's yeah. or Freeman's catalogue man. And uh, yeah. I coveted the toy pages, I'll have you know. The toy yeah, pages. Well, in the autumn the autumn winter edition, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In, in public, the um, the toy pages. In the room that I just mentioned, in the pantry <laughs> room, it was the uh, underwear section. <laughs> Quite possibly. Check it out going, oh, look at that. Oh, like, and there was already skinny women in that. Because so, obviously it was the time, wasn't it? It was. Did you ever sign up to the monthly game clubs from magazines? The monthly no, subscriptions where they send you a game each month? No, no. No, I never did that. No. Pay for games? <laughs> <laughs> well, we had a game rental place in Grimsby, so. We, we did, yeah. Before. And, they, and they copied them and said they cheaper. <laughs> I know. And then the daft thing is, right, I'm, just as a quick aside on that, I didn't realise how rare that actually was. I didn't realise what what an amazing service that was because you know as we've talked to gone through all these games for the podcast and as we've talked and we've talked with our patrons on the on our Discord, which you can get exclusive access to if you join our Patreon. By the way, when we chat to them regularly, the impression I get is that you know the rental of games that we had and that idea that we could just go and get any game we wanted and rent it is is kind of unheard of because there was a lot of people yeah. who you know and we didn't I didn't have the money to buy lots of these games back then. I had a few, but I was renting quite a lot of them because I think it was a pound ago, was it, to rent them? I seem to remember or something like that, which uh, may yeah, seem yeah, like a was, lot, yeah. but it was a, it was a, for my mum and dad, that was a quick shut up. You know, I'd, if I could, if they could stop me banging on about something for a quid, yeah. then that was a quite, I think that was a quick win for him. Mm, yeah. <laughs> for God's sake, here, go and get it, shut up. Hey, win. <laughs> Speaking of, um, someone mentioned, I think we got asked about Quo Vardis earlier on. I remember the Quo Vardis box always being on the shelf and never being off it. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever rented yeah. Quo Vardis because when it <laughs> when it started, started, I think the first game I rented was that Alien one. Yeah, that was a, that was quite a big box. Wasn't it? it was, but that Quo Vardis box was always <laughs> yeah. there. And it never moved. There was like yes. a, it was like a when you move a picture off a wall and it's got the ring around it. There were the painting had the wall. You know, hasn't been affected by the sunlight. <laughs> Quo Vardis was like that. If you took it away, it was off always the wall. there, wasn't it? Remember the yeah. Sentinel was the same. Nobody ever seemed to rent the Sentinel. Nah, no one wanted ago. them. No one did. What game did you play in the arcades and then bought for your C64 because you played it in the arcade? Was it everything you expected? Green Beret. Yes, it was Ace. Um, I bought Green Beret day of release and I was more than satisfied. I think, if I'm going to be honest, um, probably Kung Fu Master because I really liked that in the arcade. Okay. And was I disappointed? I was a little bit, I think the blockiness of it was a little bit off-putting, but I still thought it was really good fun. So, and it was, I was able to play Kung Fu yeah. Master at home. So, well, I mean, you mentioned earlier you bought the Gauntlet games. Yeah, but that, I think I wasn't. I did like the arcade, but I don't know. I just, I thought the, I, I always thought it'd be better. <laughs> I thought the C64 because it looked like the sort of thing the C64 would be good at. Yeah, I was yeah. wrong. I was so badly wrong. I think I, I think I bought Yeah Kung Fu as well. Um, and I, I like that. I, th- I thought it was a good, good conversion. Yeah, it's a good arcade conversion. It is, and it's got great music as well. So it has, yeah. So I think I was happy with that as well. I don't think I bought much after that. But yeah. did you like the ZX Spectrum? No. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I didn't. I did. Well, I, did. I, I remember going around to my friends' houses and playing on some of their games and just being like, "I've got to use keys." Yeah, yeah, there was some of that. So, I mean, I had I had one friend that had, was all keys all the time, and I had two like proper dedic friends who were dedicated Spectrumites. I mean, they were like, you know, and we used to have like almost like 
running battles with each other about how good the games were going to be in each other's system. And so, and there was me and another guy um, called Chris who had a C64 at the time. We're going back to school, school. And then there was my friend Richard and Simon who were both Spectrum owners. And so, and that was good because we got to sort of experience some of the breadth and some of them. Now, do I like this Zelda Spectrum? Would I, would, I, would I like to have owned one? No. Did I like some of the things that were done on it? Yes. Because there were some interesting things. I remember playing Gift from the Gods on that and really enjoying that on the Spectrum because that's quite a nice game. So mm-hmm. I like all of the um, Ultimate Play the Games on the Spectrum better than any other version. So I much prefer Attic Attack on a Spectrum. I much prefer um, Jetpack and things like that. They just work better on a Spectrum. The sounds yeah, they were, and everything, they were, they were written I, I aligned to that. They were written specifically for that machine, so they're always going to exactly. be... So I like the Spectrum because it has that on it and also because it was the... It was the tip of the spear for going for people to be able to start to think about creating games at home, and creating a home experience. And no matter, say what you want about the Spectrum itself as a weird rubber keyed thing, but that did open the door for people to start to think. Actually, yeah. there's a, there, there may be yeah. money and career in them their hills, and whether they went from Spectrum or stuck on that, or whether they moved on to other things, it was the tip of the spear for a lot of people to start their careers in game development. And of course, that's a good thing. That's always a good thing. Yeah. But the question was, did you like it? So at the time, I didn't. But I can see, I, I, I have, a, I have an appreciation for it now and where it sits within computer game history. But as a fourteen, you know, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen year old at school, it was Spectrum owners versus C sixty four owners. Everyone knows it, it that was. playground battle. So you know. So uh, did I like? Did I like it? Yes. But did I like C sixty four more? Obviously, and also. You always had the music. You always had the Sid shit. Yeah, it was always the killer, wasn't it? You just put you could put a tape on. You could put a tape on the C64 yeah. music, and then you know what yeah. could you get on the? Well, C- you could one? record one. <laughs> yeah, what could you get on the Spectrum? <laughs> Uh, yeah, and they, they try to impress you with certain certain games. But you know, when Tim Fallon came along, and did some sort of Spectrum magic, and you got some really good Agent X. I think was one that they all raved about on the Spectrum, having good music. And you're like, that's not good music. Just put crazy comments on and go. Just take a take a note, take a pill, <laughs> yeah, listen to yeah. that. Yeah, listen to Knuckle Shut Busters, up. listen to Warhawk, yeah, Knuckle Busters, Warhawk, or, or any of the Galway ones. You know, well, yeah. just, let's just put Hypersports on for a minute. All right, let's talk about that, shall we? Yeah, shut up. Yeah. Did you get games from record stores or game stores? Uh, yeah. Either. Neither. It was Boots Neither. or WH Smiths or... If I bought them, Boots. If I didn't buy them, everywhere in Europe and the world. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> um, finally, do you find space for any recently created C64 games? Yes, I do. Uh, I, I don't at the moment. I just... There's too much... I'm keeping... Obviously, my job, I need to keep up with games, modern stuff. So that takes up that time. So the only games, C64 games I play for the podcast. I, play, I keep an eye on I, and I play them as well. I play some of the new ones. This has been some amazing ones. Go, Carlton's latest, latest game was really good. Yeah, I gave run that run and, run and Gun. Yeah, I gave Run and Gun a go. Run and gun. So really good. Nice. And also the Molly and, oh, not Ollie and, Ma- say Ollie and Lisa, that wasn't his, was it? Uh, was it Molly, um, was it? Million, 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 yeah, Million, Million Molly, Molly something like that. But these recent I've got, ones. I've got it on my phone. Hang on. Carlton Handley's recent games, they're definitely Earth. If you haven't. Yeah, it is Million Molly, yeah. Million Molly, they're both brilliant, and go, you know they're really, really good and really good fun, and also really well put together. I would recommend, you know, if he, if there's a donation for Mister Handley to be able to get those, you know, don't pirate them. God's sake, you know, even if they might be free, but there's probably a donate. Do donate a little bit because that guy's yeah, taking time I to bought, create I them. And they're my, really good. I bought Million yeah. Molly on Android, and I thought I bought yeah, so I bought from them. Itch. Really good stuff. Liam Carew asks, "Hi guys, after issue ninety, Zap Six Two tragically changed its name to Commodore Force. Will you be covering those issues too?" I don't think there's any plan to is there there's no plan no, to we, 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 zap we call zap to the past for a reason yeah so. yeah so that's that's there's not a plan to lee dove asks are there any multi-format games where you've ended up preferring the c64 version and are there any multi-format games where you'd recommend other versions over the c64 uh yeah there's plenty of multi-format games where i've ended up green beret <laughs> that was always better than any other version that, um yeah yeah i think most most actually were better on the c64 yeah. generally generally the game series because i think the game series some of the winter games i think was released on the spectrum and stuff wasn't it when they say multi-format do they mean games that were released on other computers and consoles yeah so specky amstrad um msx um, i guess things well, like that it depends where you are in the life cycle doesn't it early on most c64 had generally the better conversions of most things outside of things like head over heels and the vector games all the rest of them pretty yeah good. yeah yeah later down the line where the deports are coming in not so much no, they yeah, tend to be better on some, yeah uh, on true Amiga yeah yeah i'm not sure about sort of amiga and stuff like that but but yeah so when if you're talking 8-bit i mean other multi-format games anything that was vectors or isometric was generally better on yeah. a, Z, a z80 processor amstrad or spectrum always yeah. were better than the c64 ones generally so yeah dr goggle says what was your experience with arcade machines when you were growing up it's a multi-part question so uh, what were your favorite arcade games wow 
Okay, well, we lived in a seaside town, or at least near one. Yes. So our we experience with arcade machines, well, we were lucky because we had we had our many, actually, at a certain point, there was principally an entire promenade full of different arcades, yeah. and they all had different arcade games in, or at least, a gra- and so we had a great collection, an entire seafront's worth of yeah. arcade games. There was some slot gambling and all that, but the, back then, the majority were actually games you could play. There was, oh, yeah. there was quite a lot. Yeah, in the 80s, it was just it was just arcade. The mm. gambling machines weren't even a thing back then. There were fruit machines, one-armed bandits, and things like that, yeah. but mostly it was well, video they were, games. They were sort of sealed. They were 18 plus as well, to an extent, weren't they, in some sort? Yeah, you tended to get the sort of the arcade game games were... But they were also replete in things like leisure centers and places like that. So there weren't just, you know, we had, yep. when we had two of those, so because there was an arcade in the leisure center in Grimsby because they had a cafe upstairs and there was a mini arcade there. And then there was, there was Cleethorpe's leisure center that also had a cafe with a mini arcade in yeah. it. And there was several games in there. So um, we and we had was quite well versed for them. And we had the arcade in the town center as well, Lucky Las Vegas. Yeah, yeah. So we, we had quite a few places to go and play them. Yeah. So we did. And um, what were your favourite arcade games? I'll, I'll say Green Bray again. Things like, um, for me, uh, Golden Axe. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I, used to, I used to love Golden Axe. E- early on, Tron. Um, yeah. Because they, 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 they had Tron in the leisure centre. So uh, They did. So they I used to play indeed. a lot of that. They had, they had the full sit-down Star Wars cabinet, didn't they, in the leisure centre? They did. Which yeah, is kind of yeah. crazy. You think about the full sit-down yeah. Star Wars one, <laughs> just, just in the cafe. <laughs> yeah. Mad. So that was always one of the you know the original Star Wars machine. I was never a big fan of the the, the space areas and things like that. I found them just a bit too no. chaotically fast. Um, yeah, it wasn't quite my thing. But side scrollers, so is it Ninja Guidance, things like that, um, or uh, Strike? Not Strike, not Strike. What's the one? Shadow Warrior, things like that. Mm. Um, I used to like. You were big on your um, sort of belt scrollers, weren't you? Yeah, I always liked all of the side scrolling, any of the Capcom variations, any of them, the side scrolling, right up to and including things like Golden Axe, that kind of game. Left mm. to right, beat things up. Final fight, absolutely adore. I still like that game now to this day. I love it. Mm. Um, but I also had a lot of time for um, Ghosts and Goblins. I really liked in the arcade and, and yeah. any of those types. Um, I was less keen on the Donkey Kongs and Pac-Mans. I mean, they, they, I did play them a bit in Space Invaders. I did play because they were kind of around. I, when they got a little bit more graphically, you know, interesting, that's when I really started to peak me. So Tron was a good one of that because I was really into the movie. Everyone was back then. Yeah. So Tron, and it really did look like the, the sort of film. So that was a really nice, you know, the first time I'd felt brand alignment, really, I think, if I was being honest. I thought, yeah. back, I think actually the brand had extended into an arcade and it really felt like you were playing parts of Tron. Mm. Um and then things like Kung Fu Master I really liked, obviously stuff like that. So I've always had a bit of an affinity for the, the walking and beating and fighting type games. Um, less the sh- less the side scrolling shoot ups that came were about, all the sort of the bottom sc- bottom up scr- shooters, you know, the Gorfs and the Galaxians and stuff like that. They were all right, but I was never that into them. Yeah, I, w- I mean, I was hugely into uh, the uh, Nemesis, Vulcan Venture, Salamanders. I, I absolutely loved them. Yeah, more, you, you more... really like the sort of shooters. Yeah, I just absolutely adored them because they were visually incredible and they were just really good fun and just you'd get a really good experience out of them for you know for a couple of minutes and you'd be like, yeah, I, I enjoyed that time. Um, absolutely. Big things. I mean, also weird stuff. Um, uh, uh, Super Sprint. I used to really enjoy Super Sprint. Yeah, you liked your, you. You might be saying that, and um, I had. To, I have to say, so, like Star Wars, there were certain games that I really liked. Star Wars, I think the games that plunged me into a bit of the universe, I liked, or the games that were just really good graphically. That, and I always had a little bit of a thing for games that really sort of pushed the envelope. So even though I couldn't get for any further than three minutes in, things like Firefox and Dragon's Lair and Space Ace, they just mesmerised me in the arcade because they were. Yeah. They're not really arcades, are they? I mean, they're arcades and that you put money in, but they're not in the same sort of way. But they just I just found them. In fact, they fascinated me. The idea that there was this this ability to create cartoons and make them into these things. That blew my mind as a, as a mm. very impressionable were you, were you, uh, did person. Did you like any um, racing games? Were you any racing game fan? Or? I was never any good at them, and that remains true to this day. All right. So no, nothing um, like OutRun or... I loved OutRun because I loved the music, and I still do. But I could never get anywhere in it. What was the sci-fi bike one? Was it Stun Runner? Stun Runner, yeah. Stun yeah, Runner. I, I remember that, and I remember used to liking that. And I, I, part of the experience, I mean, when the I think they somewhere had a, the bike for Super Hang On or Hang On. Um, yeah. So I, I didn't mind enduro races. So some of them were pretty good as well. Yeah, I, there was games I would go and if I saw that I would try and make a beeline for it, and there was games that I'd go on just because it was I wanted to see what it was like. 
and Space mm. Area, things like that. And I would never really go on them again because I was crap. Mm. Um, and so anything like that. But some games I, I felt I, I was actually quite good at, things like um, Kung Fu Master and the, the sort of Final Fights and those kind of games who were Dynasty Wars and Dynasty Warriors and all those, where I felt like yeah, I got yeah. value for my money and I didn't mind yeah. pumping the odd continue in. So. What about the uh, Commando style stuff? Did you, were you a fan of the Commando yeah, style? Yeah, again, Commando I liked, but the, I, the Warriors, arcades... Mercs. All that sort of stuff. I always found that in Cleethorpes, they always put the... Because you set the dip switches on the arcades for the difficulty level, and they always ramped up the difficulty on all of them. So you you weren't getting a long time on those games for your money, which was the point, no. I guess. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, don't, I, I felt ripped off by them. Even though the games were quite good, I just felt like I was never going to get anywhere. So what's the point? I always lasted a bit longer on things like Star Wars or any yeah. of those other ones that we spoke about. Uh, just adding on to that, were there any arcade ports for the C64 you were really looking forward to and then massively disappointed? Yeah, loads. <laughs> um, um, yeah. There was a, a lot of, I mean, I think, I, I mean, when I remember seeing Space Area going, oh. Yeah, Outrun. Because Outrun, Space Area, yeah. Um, just, just anything where, if it weren't, you know, Ghost, I think Ghost and Goblins I did like at the time, so I was all right with that. Um, I didn't rate it as high as Zap did, but I thought it was all right. Greenberry was good. It was great, sorry. I'm trying to think, what were the sort of arcade games that really, I was like, oh my God, that's just dreadful. What the, what's happened there? I don't Because I don't think I played any of the really crap ones that we've come across. Power Drift, I remember, and Operation Wolf. I never really liked them in the arcade, Operation Wolf, but I remember thinking the 664 version is rubbish. And Power Drift, goodness me. You know, really, that's really C- highly I mean, rated, yeah. Power Drift, on the C64. Yeah, and, and I don't doubt the C64's, you know, p- pushing its little capabilities as much as it possibly can. Yeah. But I never really liked the arcade that much. So, again, it's a racing game, and I wasn't very good at them. Yeah. So. I think, I'd, I mean, I had a bit of a... I had a bit of a penchant for um, the Atari games in the, in, in the arcades because I really liked the sounds. It was the sound yeah, of arca- Atari game. Always beefy. So I was always disappointed when they came to the C64, like Paperboy. Mm. So the Paperboy yeah. version on the C64 was really disappointing because yeah. things like that. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, AL82 Retro says, this could probably be a separate category for the Golden Breadman Awards, but which C64 game wins your personal award for stupidest story, pointless, nonsensical exposition so far? Oh, God, there's a long list for that. <laughs> it's, it's, there's a long <laughs> list for that. I can't. And we've talked We've talked about adding a category for that, haven't we? I can't what we were going to call it now. Is it the... Um, I don't know. Because we've got, we've got the Homer's Doorbell Award, haven't we, for annoying music coming? <laughs> yeah. Oh, um... <laughs> Oh, just pointless exposition. There's loads of, there's there's so loads many. of pointless exposition. This, this been, in the most recent episodes of the podcast, there's been a couple. Yeah. And you're like, why have they gone to all this length to explain all this gibberish? I mean, it makes no absolute sense whatsoever. No. I mean, even Phobia had a bit of that. Goodness. There was yeah. that one where you were driving about the city and you had to go in with the loud footsteps. With the no. sci- <laughs> that stupid one recently. <laughs> Yeah. What was that? What that was, was the that Gremlin one? one wasn't it? I can't but remember. The arenas it's where you had to go to the battle arena or whatever it was. It was also stupid. Irradiated city, but you you lived in the last city, but you had to go visit That's other right. cities. Hey, you yeah. said it was the last one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, there's been too many. There's been there, too there many. There may be an award for them. We'd have yeah. to revisit some of them and just sort of look at the stories because you're like, hey, what's this? It was that stupid one that looked a bit like um, Luft Rousers recently, where aliens had come out and sort of set fire to the Gulf yeah. of Hormuz for, for reasons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was the, some Operation Hormuz, wasn't it? Yeah, Operation Hormuz. Like Hormuz, yeah. yeah. Like, what? Yeah, this, well, if you think there's that, just any of it, even stuff like, what was that stupid French kickboxing game? So what Bob Winner? I mean, that was that, Bob Win Winner. Bobner. For God's sake, Win <laughs> Bobner. I mean, if, you know, that's a stupid story. Or Lee Enfield. So that, had a, that had a comic. Or Lee Enfield. Yeah, Lee Enfield, where the, some, someone had stolen something from the Pope and taken it back to the 14th century or something. Yeah, don't stupid. Yeah, no. There's loads of them, and there may be a special award, but there may be. it's going to be hard fought. Yeah. <laughs> Nick Bungus says, if you had some weird time portal communication device thing that allowed you to talk to the designers of the C64 before its release, what hardware spec changes would you ask them to make and why? Obviously, you can't say 10 terabyte of RAM and 2 gigahertz processor, but things that would keep the price reasonable and were accessible at the time. Good Lord. Um, <laughs> I don't know, because they kind of got, they kind of got the the formula right on the C sixty four pretty much. It was the about the maximum amount of memory you could have that was going to be affordable in a machine of its type. Bespoke sound chip's pretty good. The Vic chip was pretty good. That's what I mean. Is um, is the C sixty four and you probably might know this better than I will do, is the C sixty four the first what we would say a sort of a traditional three chip computer setup? You know, no, where it, the Atari did it before that. Did it? 
yeah, so the, did, it, did, it have a dedicated, did it have a dedicated graphics chip, sound chip, and central processor? The, what it's, I mean. the Atari com- the Atari computers did. Yeah, right. Okay, the Atari later computers, and so did the um, I think the Apple II did. Was I that an American? Well. Was that an American thing? Because the English ones like Amstrad and stuff like that and Spectrum were all systems. They were just one chip, weren't they? They were all they were all central CPU, I think. Yeah, and then they didn't With have no a dedicated graphics, graphics chip, chip or sound yeah. chip or anything. I don't know. They had a, they did have a in the Atari, I think. Sorry, Atari in the Amstrad that had a, did have a sound chip, didn't it? Because but I don't know if that's a legacy when they came later with the. I don't know. The Spectrum One to Eight had a sound chip, but if you're going for the base, the boilerplate stuff, Z80. Most of them had Z80 processors, didn't they? Some yeah. of those, the sort of BBC Micros, the Spectrum, the Spectrums, the Amstrad, the six five zero two, six five one zero. Was it actually the variation of that in the C sixty four? Yeah, something like that. And that idea of having a sound chip, video chip, and a, a, sa- and a C- central CPU that we're able to then offset things using sort of interrupts, that's pretty unique. That is pretty unique. Not many, because I think there's only really, maybe the Atari computers did something similar, because they had the, I think it's the, not the Polo, that's the Amiga, they had the, um, they had the pokey, pokey did, chip. They had the pokey for sound. Yeah, so I don't know said, what the graphics chip was, though. I think they had a bespoke graphic chip in the, the Atari computers, not the Atari consoles, but the Atari computers had a, a graphic chip. I could be wrong. I'm pretty sure they did, but I don't remember it because they have quite a good, they're very similar machines to the Z64, the, those Ataris. Is it the Atari 800? Like that. The Atari 800 XL, the Atari 400 XL, yeah. So, and I think they did because, uh, but I, I don't know for sure. But the question is, what would I do to improve the C64? I think the only thing I would do, I would probably give it a little bit more of a, of a central CPU clock speed. That's all I would have given it. Just given it, because that way, those some of those vector games that they were pushing mm. out there, because the, and the way that the CPU stuns the VIC chip, so that's why you get bad, why you get raster lines, where you only get the sort of cycle counting and stuff that's on the 64 that's become important is because of the way that the that the VIC and the, the CIA timers and the VIC timers and the, and the 6502 processor work together in that kind of weird way. Now, they work really well in some ways, but there is that kind of unusual stunning of the CPU where it sort of stuns it for a second so it can do stuff and then comes back to it, and that's why you get these bad lines. Mm. Um so I, I maybe negate that somehow and give it a little bit more clock speed. Not massive amounts, but give it a little bit more so that you add a, a CPU that was more aligned to the vector speed of, say, a BBC Micro or something like that. So that kind of Z80 or a bit more, I don't know, coprocessor maybe or something like that. But that's it. I like the C64 the way it is because of its... But it's its limitations that make it made it great. I mean, would it have been possible to have doubled the number of hardware sprites to six to 16? Yeah, I think you could, again you could you could you know an upgrade to the Vic chip would probably have allowed that in some way, but maybe that would probably require more. You need more RAM. I mean, they take up everything takes up memory, so yeah. But I mean, the, but what I'm saying is that would have made easier because obviously they have all those sprites in memory because when they're multiplexing, you get loads of sprites on screen. So they, they do have they do have all those sprite data in well, in memory. Would it have been easier to have just would it have eased programmers because it would have been if you could have just had 16 without having to write a multiplexer. Um, um, yes, yeah. I mean, essentially, yeah, and that's what later machines do. But it didn't have the CPU clock speed to push that around. Right. So okay. that's why I say a, a, a better clock speed for a CPU, just a better, a faster processor, slightly faster, not mega fast, slightly faster. But did it not, I'm a I mean, big believer was, in. They were putting a lot of sprites on screen with just a one megahertz processor anyway. But so. it's, it's not. It's, it's not lots of sprites on screen. That's a trick. That's a that's a raster trick. That's the CPU um, okay. starting another sprite count on the, on another raster line. That's there's still eight sprites. It's not displaying any more than eight. It just looks like it does. Right. Okay. So there's not like there's 32 sprites on the screen. There isn't. There's eight sprites on the screen. There's just a lot of splits, and they're restarting the sprites the sprite counter further down. So it's it's a trick. Right. Okay. But um, the idea of my, for me. I, I'm a big believer in that um, the hardware limitations and the hindrances of what people had to climb over in order to get the greatness out of the C64. Had you made it easy for them at the start, none of the FLIs, none of the super crazy techniques and hacks and things that have made the C64 really clever, none of those things would have probably come about because it had those challenges and because it had those faults and those crazy weird things that went wrong with it and didn't quite work. People were able to create exploits for those and those exploits of what have led to some really amazing stuff. Yeah. And that's what's kind of kept that machine going. Like getting so, rid of the border and things like that and sprites yeah, in the border exactly. and everything just, like that, yeah. As soon as people started to figure out that there was little ways of hacking things out, the machine just kept on being interesting and it still is to this day they're still discovering this stuff now so crazy good mm. david hearn asks you've got the late shift in the zap to the past saloon as barkeep a cylon a dalek a romulan <laughs> and star commander travis walk in who do you serve first and why <laughs> who's star commander travis he's from blake seven is he okay all right he's the he's the baddie in blake seven <laughs> pro i don't know who do you serve first <laughs> 
I have no well, idea. I mean, it's just if you think about it in logically, so okay, uh, go on, a Dalek then. is immediately going to try and kill you because they 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 hate all life that isn't a Dalek. So they would not only try and kill you, they'd try and kill everybody. Um, and <laughs> so, a Cylon is going to so tr- going to try and drunk. convert you. Well, yeah, Dalek's going to try and kill everyone. A Cylon is also going to try and kill everyone because they want them to everyone to be Cylons because they want you part of the Cylon collective. Romulans are quite sneaky, and um, so they're they're not likely to cause any. You won't even know they were there. They kind of stay in the background and just be sneaky and. Travis will just be looking for Blake. Um, <laughs> so, so I think I think a s- prob- either the Dalek or the Cylon, because you know what Cylon's like. Is it a human Cylon though? Does it look like a human? Could be, couldn't it? Cylon. Oh, what is it? Trisha Helfer? Or, or... Yeah, well, if it was her, she'd get served first. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Ladies first. Ladies <laughs> yeah, first. If it's Come Trisha on. Helfer or uh, Davros. Sorry, Davros. Sorry, Davros. I'm going <laughs> to. And also, I'd question the ability of, of a Dalek to be able to drink. You know, could I have a drink? How you, when, what it are you going to drink it with? With a built-in straw. That's not a straw. That's his weapon. It's, his <laughs> it's got three weapon. of them. One of them's bound to be a straw. It's got. It's got three. It's got two. It's got a plunger, and you can't drink with a plunger. <laughs> you don't. There's a hole in there. It's just, <laughs> Thank you very much. Look, <laughs> I'll have another. I have another. <laughs> if a Dalek's got a hole in its plunger, it needs to get to the uh, the, the tech center and get it repaired. That ain't helping anybody. So I don't know. Is a Dalek? Dalek's going to be angry, and you're going to, you know, they're rude, aren't they? There was a plunger on the head, and there were two down below. There were three. It's not a plunger on its head. That's its eye. That's a plunger. It's that's its eye. You can't drink through its eye. Can you drink through your eye? Yeah, but I said they had three appendages, three limbs. They, they do. One is their it eye. Does. One is goes. their weapon, and one is their plunger. But so they still got three, which I was right. I'm looking at a picture of a Dalek you, now. You said it, you said it had a straw. <laughs> well, one of them could be a straw. You don't know what they are. <laughs> What's it use its plunger for? Unblocking toilets. <laughs> what do you think? What do you use yours for? Dalek plumbing services. <laughs> exactly. We will unblock your toilet. We will exterminate all blockages. <laughs> exactly. Exterminate your blockage. <laughs> My God, we, what is that? <laughs> we obey no blockage. That's um, a proper Davros down there. So in answer to the question, I think I'd probably, the Dalek would demand to be served. So Dal- it'd be Dalek first. Cylon second, Romulan third, and then Star Commander Travis would only be looking for Blake anyway. And I'd be like, he's over there. And that'd be the end of that. That'd be the end of that. There, there you go. go. And there we go. That's it. There's our questions. That's, That's the <laughs> the range of questions. That's the kind of questions we get asked. It's my favourite question ever, that last one, I think. I one of my favourite ones ever, that. <laughs> it, I, I thought it was going to be the start of a joke, if I'm perfectly it's honest. Just, it's, it's the sort of thing that Bernard Manning would have cracked. A Cylon, a Dalek, yeah. and a Romulan walk, walk into a bar. Dalek and a Romulan and a Walk into a bar. You had a wonderful time. <laughs> <laughs> Bernard right on. Bernard right on, yeah. So, yeah, thanks for those. That's, that was cool. I enjoyed doing that. I always like uh, these kind of crazy questions. Hopefully you've enjoyed listening to us answer them as well. And if you wish to yes. get in on that action and you want to ask us some questions for our next Hasta podcast, which will probably happen at some point, then obviously join the patreon doing the patreon.com but patreon.com forward slash sap to the past and you can you know you can get in on this and and yeah so there you go do that Mm. i think that's about it uh hopefully you've enjoyed this i did enjoy it we will be back next week with where normal service will be resumed we're finishing off july with another five games which we told you about at the end of last week so i'm not repeating them again that's also because i don't have the list in front of me (laughs) yeah we don't need to just go back and listen to last week. <laughs> yeah, just go listen to it. So, yeah, do you have anything to add, Graham? Or oh, should we call it a no, day? No, no, it's always fun to answer the questions. So, it's been thank you for asking them. Um, and remember, if you want to, you know, ask these questions and join in, if you listen to this, and just join the join us join the fun in the Patreon because we've got a Discord and we ain't afraid to use it. So, we're always on there chatting to our patrons. We've got a very good relationship with them. And if we ever do decide to do some kind of get together, then you'll be included and you can come join us. Absolutely, you'll be there with us, beating us at all the games. It yeah, will do. Right. So, on that note. Um, I have been Adrian Mills. And I have been Graham Reddings. And you've been listening to Zap to the Past answer the questions from our awesome patrons. And we will see you again next week. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to the Zap to the Past podcast. We hope you enjoyed our deep dive into the world of Commodore 64 games, as well as the music, films and TV from around the 1980s, driven, of course, by the issue of Zap 64 magazine published at that time. We will return with a whole new batch of games and stuff to talk about next week. Until then, if you want to listen to or download previous episodes of Zap to the Past, and why wouldn't you, they can all be found on our website at zaptothepast.com, as well as being available on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Deezer, Audible, Player FM, and, well, pretty much anywhere where we can upload them. By the way, we do always love to hear from our amazing listeners, so if you'd like to contact us about anything in the podcast or beyond, you can do so by emailing us at zaptothepast at gmail.com. 
We're also active on Twitter under at Zaptuther, as well as Facebook, Instagram, and most social media platforms. Just search for Zap to the Past and you'll find us. Oh, and if you like the podcast and what we're doing, please do like, share, review, rate us. It really helps. Something, apparently. The Zap to the Past podcast is written and produced by Adrian Mills and Graham Raddings and recorded at Flaky Bits 2.0 Studio. All opinions expressed are those of the writers, and while we indeed love Zap64 magazine, the Zap to the Past podcast is not affiliated with it in any way. Stay safe, see you next time, and remember, we play these games so you don't have to.